My name is uh, Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University. And on behalf of the Institute and on behalf of our co-sponsor uh, for this evening's event, the uh, School of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs, I want to welcome you out to our event. Uh, the, for those of you who don't know about the Foley Institute, let me just say a few words about us and then I'll introduce our uh, panelists uh, for this evening. The Foley Institute was established on campus here in 1995 to honor the service of Thomas S. Foley, who was former Speaker of the House of Representatives. And our mission here is threefold. It's to encourage research on public policy issues. It is to get students involved and engaged in public service. And we do that in large part through uh, internship programs. And if any of you are interested in internship programs, now is the time to come talk to us. So I encourage you to do that. And then finally, it is to uh, bring to campus and to the broader university community uh, programming and educational opportunities about vital issues of, of public policy and public affairs, such as tonight's event. And actually, it's very fitting that uh, tonight's event uh, is, is taking place uh, around the issue of climate change. It's actually an inaugural series that we are instituting on science, public policy, and ethics then we hope to have one of these symposia uh, at least uh, each semester in the coming years. Uh, and it's, it's particularly appropriate because Tom Foley's, uh, one of his areas of particular interest was environmental policy and policy making, and he was very active in that area in his legislative career. And in fact, we're honored to have with us uh, one of the holders of the Thomas S. Foley Professorship in Environmental Policy, Gene Rosa. Um, our panel tonight um, will actually, uh, each of the speakers will get up and, and give a short presentation, after which we'll open it up for discussion and questions from the audience. Uh, we have uh, four uh, very distinguished guests with us tonight. Um, our first speaker tonight will be Bill Cabasenchi, who's one of my colleagues in the School of Politics, uh, Philosophy, and Public Affairs. He's an assistant professor in the school. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Tennessee, and he specializes in the areas of bioethics, virtue ethics, and moral psychology. Following Bill will be Kent Keller, it's to his immediate left. Kent is a professor in WSU School of Earth and Environmental Sciences. He's also the co-director of the Center for Environmental Research, Outreach, and Education, uh, which is often goes by the name Serio here on campus. Professor Keller is widely published and has recently taught courses on groundwater, environmental geology, issue and, e and, and issue and ethics in natural resources and the environment. Following uh, Professor Keller will be Andrew Light. Andrew uh, is our, our guest from out of town this evening. He is the director for the Center of Global Ethics at George Mason University, where he is also associate professor of philosophy and environmental policy, and he's a senior fellow and director of the International uh, of International Climate Policy at the Center for American Progress. Uh, Professor Light earned his PhD in Ethics and Public Policy from UCLA, and he is currently working on projects involving U.S. participation in international climate and energy agreements. And then our final speaker this evening will be Professor Jean Rosa, who is the Edward R. Meyer Professor of Natural Resources and Environmental Policy and the Boeing Distinguished Professor of Environmental Sociology at Washington State University. Uh, Professor Rosa has been at WSU since 1978, and his current research focuses on technological risk and global environmental change. So uh, join me now in welcoming our panelists. Okay, thank you all for coming out tonight. <clears throat> so um, I organized my talk, there's a whole bunch of things you could say about the ethics of global climate change. I decided to organize my talk around three lines of thought. And as it turns out, I managed to uh, make connections to each one of my three panelists with uh, one of the lines of thought. So, so uh, the first one is gonna connect to our scientist on the panel, uh, Professor Keller. Any climate scientists in the audience tonight? Is anyone here an expert in climate science? I don't see any hands. I'm not either. I'm not qualified to actually say whether global climate change is happening because I'm not an expert, right? Um, and there's an, it's a complicated scientific issue and I'm just not qualified, right? A PhD in philosophy doesn't get you that kind of training. So 
consider this quote from John Hardwick. This is the guy I wrote my dissertation with. Uh, he uh, built a small intellectual industry around the idea of epistemic dependence, that there's an awful lot that we know that we don't know for ourselves, but we know because someone else told us. And then he uh, developed from that the idea of an ethics of expertise, right? So consider that quote real quick. I'll let you read it. I find that last sentence especially jarring. Areas in which expert opinion exists and is available are areas in which one ought not to make up one's own mind without first becoming an expert. So that has implications for us when we think about whether or not um, global climate change is happening. Uh, Hardwig suggests, and I want to sort of adapt and develop his ideas about an ethics of expertise. And so the first thing to say about this is I think there are uh, ethical obligations for experts, and then I'll also develop the idea that there are ethical obligations for those of us who aren't experts. But if you need an argument, it goes like this, right? We need trust because there's an awful lot that we can't know for ourselves. Uh, and there's a possibility of abuse or misuse of trust. So we need an ethic to guide this crucial social practice, social con and ethical conditions that make our trust of experts appropriate. Yeah, and as I said, that raises ethical responsibilities for both expert, experts and lay people. So what are some uh, maxims for experts? Well, they go like this. Where there's uncertainty, don't understate it. Don't stifle dissent within the community of experts. Explain inferences from uncertainty. There's an awful lot that scientists do that uh, is inference from relatively uncertain variables. So try to explain that as best you can, rather than present a picture in which science is sort of giving us deliverances straight from the book of nature. Uh, acknowledge a lack of consensus, but avoid giving the impression that every position is equally viable. When there isn't a consensus, that rarely means that every position on the table is equally viable. Right? Be aware of others seeking rationalization for what they already believe, or the politi politicization of your work. Don't attempt to compensate for these with overcorrection, and keep the high ground and be clear about why it's the high ground. Why is it the high ground? Uh, ostensibly, it's because as an expert in some area of intellectual inquiry, you're pursuing the truth as best we can know it, right? That's the high ground. Uh, so don't let that be co-opted for political or other gain. Engage in quality assurance through protecting your own ranks against those who are not worthy of trust. If uh, expertise often resides in communities of professionals, then it's going to be really important for those professionals to make sure that their community is well represented by every member of it. I humbly suggest that eth ethics education might be a step in that direction. I teach ethics courses, both undergraduate and graduate level. I'm happy to say that a number of the graduate programs here at the university require ethics training. That's a good step. I don't think it's sufficient. I think even more still can be done to ensure that uh, the people entering the ranks of professional expertise have the right kinds of uh, intentions and dispositions. But ethics education is a good start. Right. If you want to avoid, I think this will be the, uh, the controversial one. If you want to avoid having your expertise dismissed or ignored, avoid putting yourself in positions where it could be construed as being the result of uh, a tainted influence. More explicitly, avoid conflicts of interest, especially financial conflicts of interest. Uh, and I will say, uh, just briefly, and this is a little closer to my home area of expertise, the pharmaceutical industry has really um, sort of gone through the roof in showing us that every aspect of scientific research and publishing can be corrupted by financial conflict of interest. For a brief overview, you could look at that publication by Kevin Elliott uh, to get a sense for what some of the issues are there. And in particular, he argues that uh, the three most prominent conflict of interest policies that are used in universities today are actually not very effective in addressing the fundamental problems of conflict of interest. So it seems to me that experts who want to be respected, who want to have their expertise respected, would do well to be really careful not to uh, make it look like their work is sort of a result of who's paying them. <clears throat> so an ethics for those receiving expert testimony, that's all of us in the room insofar as we're not experts in climate science. Number one, seek out well-qualified, peer-recognized experts. Look for the best people you can get this information from. Maybe before number one is even recognizing that you're not it if you're not an expert in this area. Be wary of the human tendency to rationalize, right? Psychologists have told us plenty about how strongly inclined we are to rationalize our own beliefs. So when you go looking for experts and you go looking for information, it's going to be important to make sure that you're seeking out information that will uh, actually give you a good understanding of the world and not just confirm beliefs you have for other sorts of reasons. 
I think it's a good idea to avoid the testimony of those with conflicts of interest. Certainly you should do so when you have a choice, right? If you have a choice between receiving testimony from an expert who has a conflict of interest and an expert who doesn't, I think you ought to go with the latter. And a corollary of that is you ought to support publicly funded research so that you can get uh, more research that's not conflicted. <clears throat> okay, now I want to reach out to the uh, the next member over on the table in the panel, uh, Andrew Light's been at work in uh, international climate negotiation for a number of years now. And so one way to start to think about uh, his work is to ask, what's our bargaining position in international climate negotiation, right? And what I have in mind here is, is there something more than just rational self-interest that should guide our thinking? Might it even be the case that ethical and social considerations should play a role here? I think so. Some people deny that, actually. They say the best uh, approach is going to be to do nothing because prevention is more expensive in the long term uh, over the course of time than adaptation. So a few responses to that. One, it's a disputed claim. If you hear someone making it, uh, it's worth investigating. There's a citation you could go to to uh, begin to investigate whether, in fact, it's true that prevention is more expensive than adaptation. Uh, Gardner points out in that article, we'll be adapting no matter what. So it might be a question of whether we want to adapt on our own terms uh, or whether we want to adapt to cataclysmic weather events uh, that we can't predict or anticipate. Another sort of concern I have with uh, this particular approach and this way of thinking about our, our international bargaining is uh, how do we count the worth of a life? Uh, one traditional method in uh, economics is to say what your life is worth is what you'll earn over the course of your lifetime. Right? which automatically means everybody in this room is worth a whole lot more than most other people in the world because they don't have anywhere near the earning potential of everyone in this room. Uh, that strikes me as a pretty depressing way to think about uh, what a human life is worth. I'm happy to report that there are alternative accounts, right? uh, pioneering work by an economist and philosopher named Amartya Sen and then further developed by another philosopher, Martha Nussbaum, on the, what's called the capabilities approach, argues that the way to figure out the worth of a life is in terms of what capabilities are necessary to promote and achieve human well-being. Right? What are the social and material conditions that a person would need to flourish as a human being? It strikes me as a more ethically sensitive way to think about how to count costs uh, when, we're trying to when we're trying to figure out what it will cost either to attempt to prevent global climate change or simply try to adapt to it. And there's a pretty standard critique that uh, these traditional economic approaches fail to capture all the relevant sorts of costs, and I uh, certainly second that kind of concern. Consider this quote. Uh, when we th going back to my original question, what should be our bargaining position uh, when we come to the table with other nations to think about uh, global climate change. So another quote, uh, I'll be quiet for a second and let you read this, uh, also from Gardner. So Gardner reports a, a pretty strong consensus. Uh, why is that? Well, one argument would go like this, it's our mess, we should clean it up. Another argument would say, we've already taken way more than our fair share of the atmosphere. I should say that we here is the developed world. That would certainly include the United States. The United States may be more so, actually, than any other part of the developed world. Uh, another way to conceptualize this is to think about how most of our emissions uh, would count as luxury emissions uh, compared to what are, in, for other people, people in other parts of the world, subsistence emissions. So any one of those could be a nice way to develop an argument that uh, if we're at all sensitive to a just allocation of uh, greenhouse gas emissions or the like, uh, we'd have good reason to uh, be prepared to take a cut in our own emissions. And if none of those arguments are compelling for you, I can report on my experience at my house. Whenever we make a pie, my kids, age 10 and 12, but they've been doing this for a lot longer than that, they're keenly interested in how uh, fairly we slice the pie. So if none of the other sort of arguments work for you, go back to the fairness we all learned growing up, right? Um, that has a, a few different kinds of emissions. One way to approach the, uh, sort of a few different implications. One way to approach this would say, Add up all the emissions we can tolerate and then divide by 7 billion and you'll get a number. That's everybody's per capita allowable emissions. What that means is in the U.S. we're going to have to seriously decrease our emissions. There are actually many parts of the world where they could increase their emissions and still uh, not meet their equal per capita allotment. <clears throat> we might say that it would be better off for uh, 
the rest of the world if we in the developed world continued to emit more than them. Uh, this might be uh, sort of with an eye towards developing technologies that would enable us ultimately to cut back on the emissions all throughout the rest of the world. Um, that has a venerable history in Rawls's theory of justice. Um, so that might be a possibility as well. Um, and that brings me to my third connection. Uh, Jean Rosa is a sociologist who does work on risk. And uh, it's very hard to get very far in a conversation these days about global climate change without someone bringing up the possibility that maybe we could fix the problem with geoengineering. So a couple of geoengineering proposals to give you a sense of what this is. One, one attempt to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere would be to uh, seed the ocean with iron filings, and this would create a plankton overgrowth. They'd absorb and consume a whole bunch of carbon dioxide and perhaps sink it down to the bottom of the ocean. Another proposal is that we put a whole bunch of mirrors in space and we attempt to reflect uh, radiation from the sun away from the earth. These wouldn't be mirrors pointed at us, unlike what we usually do. And it won't if you've never even heard of these, it won't take you very long to figure out that these are pretty risky strategies, right? Uh, each of them has the potential to radically alter uh, conditions on the earth, the ocean in one case, and uh, um, the climate, the weather patterns overall in the other case. And so that raises a question of how should we think about risk? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize how we got here. If we seriously consider geoengineering proposals, it's because we don't have the moral gumption to do other less risky things in order to mitigate or abate our emissions. So we need to be honest about that. Uh, what we're doing is we're saying, let's consider a seriously risky proposal because we're unwilling to do uh, all of the uh, more intuitively obvious, less risky sorts of things. What, what's, what are some ethical issues? Well, one is consent. You'd basically need the consent of the whole world to do this, right? It would affect potentially every part of the Earth uh, if we put mirrors in space or something like that. And so when you're engaged in a risky activity that's going to affect others, good ethics usually says, get their permission first. Don't do it without their permission. How do you get permission from everybody in the world? Maybe more importantly, how do you get permission from the people who don't even exist yet who might be most likely to be affected by this sort of thing? Um, a second sort of ethical consideration in thinking about geoengineering uh, concerns precaution. There's a, an ethical concept called the precautionary principle that essentially says exercise precaution in the face of uncertainty and risk. There's an irony about the precautionary principle when it comes to global climate change, and it goes like this. On the one hand, we might invoke the, the precautionary principle because we think the risks of doing nothing are too great. After all, uh, the projections about what might happen with global climate change are pretty dire. Um, but on the other hand, the risks of engaging in global climate, uh, engaging in geoengineering to try to uh, mitigate global climate change are also pretty risky. So the precautionary principle sort of uh, defeats itself in a scenario like that. And I don't point that out to sort of um, call into question the usefulness of the precautionary principle so much as to show the seriousness of the situation that we're in. And also, uh, before concluding, I do want to point out that when it comes to geoengineering, there are safer, albeit more expensive, methods by which we could go about geoengineering. If we think that we have a disproportionate responsibility uh, for causing the problem in the first place, as I suggested a second ago, we might think that uh, we would be more inclined to uh, take that more expensive but relatively safer set of options over the more risky options. Okay, and I'm finished. Thank you very much. Do you have a point? Okay, well, uh, thank you all for coming, and I, I appreciate the chance to uh, talk with, uh, the, uh, with this audience and with the other panelists.
Um, I want to correct my affiliation. The School of Earth and Environmental Sciences uh, was, but all of us are now part of the larger School of the Environment. Um, so I, I have some observations, and, uh, and, and I, but I need to start with some disclaimers, which is the way experts and non-experts uh, start their, uh, a presentation like this. Um, I'm, a, I'm a hydrogeologist and a biogeochemist who became interested in the, in the chemistry of the atmosphere as it's influenced by plant evolution on time scales of hundreds of millions to billions of years. And uh, I am not a paleoclimatologist. Uh, my interest was in the fact that CO2 levels uh, over these time, kinds of time periods have probably changed by factors of 10 to 30 or more. And uh, so as a, the large time scales of, of my interest uh, result in a relatively coarse-grained um, attention to these things, I'm an interested user of paleoclimate information and uh, I teach environmental geology. I'm interested in, uh, in the results of models, but I would say that I am not an expert. So we'll see how this comes out uh, relative to the framework bill uh, introduced. Um, my, my premise here is that biophysical reality is an important constraint on ethical behavior. I realize that may be sort of an old-fashioned idea, but uh, that, that motivates basically the report I'm going to give you, that's what I know how to do. Um, and, and also my idea that is in reporting to you, I can provide one example of what might be an ethical role for, for a scientist, expert or not. Okay. So we are inhabitants of what geologists call the fourth ice house. These prolonged periods of relative cold have happened at least three times in the last couple billion years of Earth history. We call this fourth ice house the Pleistocene. And I don't know if you can make it out, but this is 650,000 years before present. Here's the present. And the Pleistocene is approximately three times this long. So you could extend this panel three times to the right, and you'd have sort of a spatial representation of the length of the Pleistocene. Um, the temperature changes that have indicated here, the, the, the largest scale of the temperature changes, have been estimated by the stable isotopic composition of water that makes up layers of ice that have been cored through. So the youngest ice is here and the oldest ice is down here. Um, the, the CO2 concentrations and their changes which uh, the amplitude of the changes through the Pleistocene is about 90 ppm overall. Um, these concentrations are measured in bubbles of atmosphere trapped in the ice as it formed. Um, a few other comments here. The heartbeat of the Pleistocene, as I call it, this, the period of the big changes, which is rhythmic, as you can tell, is about 100,000 years. And, and the shape of the EKG, if you will, is, uh, is characteristic and kind of interesting. It's characterized by these uh, relatively rapid rises from cold conditions into relatively brief, warm interglacials like the one that we're in now, uh, followed by relatively slow, bumpy rides back down into a glacial maximum. And characteristically, these, the, the transitional periods are punctuated by rapid flickers of climatic conditions that can be fairly uh, fairly large. Um, temperature and CO2 change together, almost in lockstep, it would appear on this time scale of observation. And this fits with what we would expect based on our understanding of the planetary greenhouse. And this, I think, is one of the most important parts of the empirical foundation for uh, our uh, modeling efforts of the climate effects of greenhouse gases. Bear in mind, we've only experienced about a degree of warming in the 20th century. And so these changes in the Pleistocene are uh, basically brutal. Um, that this, this we know, and we know it well. The, uh, we know we are less sure about important details of the processes driving these changes. Um, it's, it's thought, it's, it's widely accepted that changes in insulation associated with changes in the shape of Earth's orbit uh, 
the tilt of its axis and the rate at which that axis processes, that these relatively modest changes in insulation constitute nudges in the climatic system that are then amplified by changing modes of global scale planetary heat transfer by the oceans and, and the atmosphere. But our ideas about how these play out uh, to yield these observations um, are really under very active discussion. Okay, so um, the Pleistocene really is the age of human evolution and development. We started way back over here somewhere and we've been developing throughout this time. And, and in, in the part of the panel that we're looking at here, social organization, language, culture, the arts, probably ethical frameworks um, developed. And, and by this time, somewhere in here, we had attained anatomical modernity. People at this time were basically just like us. So we really are children of the Pleistocene, and, and we have stepped out of, uh, out of these conditions into this last thin slice of warm climate where uh, agriculture and agricultural surpluses that support cities and writing have all developed in this last uh, brief uh, interval. So, so from our, our perch here on top the, the, uh, the current interglacial, we've initiated what is, I think, has been accurately termed the grand geophysical experiment um, of returning hundreds of millions of years of stored fossil carbon to the atmosphere in basically the geological blink of an eye. Uh, if I scaled the width of the arrow to the time scale over which this is occurring, you wouldn't be able to see the arrow. Um, the tip of the arrow represents the current CO2 rel level relative to this scale. That arrowhead has moved perceptibly during the time I've been at WSU, which isn't that long. Um, so so this, this experiment has a marvelous signal-to-noise ratio. The magnitude of the perturbation is huge. Um, and uh, conditions are, are very favorable for being able to see the consequences, thinking of this as an experimentalist. Um, but as, and, and, and that makes this exciting. It's, it's a very dynamic area of Earth science involving some of the most interested, energetic, and, and sharpest people we have. On the other hand, uh, I, I think we're all in this with due humility, recognizing the absolutely, completely unprecedented nature of the perturbation we really are in uncharted terrain here. Okay, this is my cue to, uh, to somehow get the uh, Mueller video, and I'm not successful. I need to get out of this, sorry. Is anybody from IT here who can uh, help me yep. escape? Yeah, sure, great, good. That does it. Thank you. Got it. <laughs> All right. So this is a video. Um, if I can get it to full screen. I'll just play it from here. And I'll, and I'll start it. Um, representing the last 200 years of temperature data on the continents. So all available recorded temperature measurements, and there are several billion of them, were sorted and then checked for systematic and random errors in many man years, person years of statistical analysis work by the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Group, led by Richard Muller, who is the author of this year's common reading book, Physics for Future Presidents. He appeared in October and kicked off his talk with this video, and I can't deliver the great patter that he had, but I'll try to summarize some of the main features. The red bouncing ball follows the global mean temperature. You see it's changing from 1800. And uh, this is the percentage of land coverage that, that has thermometry and its progress through time. Uh, here's the calendar year, and then the colors uh, represent uh, changes, deviations with respect to the long term, uh, w w with respect to the long term. So we see this, this great dynamically patchy uh, pattern of colors unfolding. Uh, 
um, you know, you can watch your favorite place on the globe and, and see how things change relative to the overall mean. I've watched this many times and I, and I still come back to it with great interest. So um, you can see where this is headed right now. We're, we're in this period of, of relatively small overall temperature changes, which turns out to be sort of a a uh, pause in a in a in a larger trajectory. So um, the major take-home points from this, I would say, are that the analysis definitively confirms, for those who wondered, that Earth has warmed approximately as previously estimated. You can see uh, about a degree in the 20th century. And also, as I mentioned, that the regional changes are, are gloriously dynamic and, and complex. Okay, so um, so the question then is, to what do we attribute these changes uh, that, that, that have occurred on this time scale? So this, this slide... Um, is a, is a slide showing modeling results, and basically the second half of Muller's video is shown by the black trace here. And, and I want to emphasize that, that we use models across the sciences, certainly across the earth sciences, to represent what we know and then to test that understanding. So global climate models um, are set up to predict the consequences of Earth climate system processes, and, and basically they are mathematical representations of physical laws by which we can calculate the generation of heat by absorption and re-emission of solar radiation. And then the redistribution of that heat uh, around the planet by the circulation of the oceans and the atmosphere. So uh, again, here is the second half of the, of the time period we just looked at in the video. And, uh, and it's compared to the temperatures calculated by a wide range of global climate models. Um, so the, the individual model simulations appear in, in red here as these kind of spidery lines, and their mean is this fat red line. Um, and as I said, the black is, is, the, is the observed mean that we were looking at before. The, the models are all driven by anthropogenic and natural influences, including increases in greenhouse gases, in aerosols, changes in solar radiation having to do with solar fluctuations, and as influenced by volcanic eruptions. And you can see that the observations rarely leave the envelope of the climate simulations, that the trends are reproduced reasonably well, and that specific punctuating events like these major volcanic eruptions are also uh, produced very nicely. The, uh, the fuzzy range that's generated here gives an idea of uncertainty associated with the modeling. And that's fine, that's great, but, but here's the reason I'm, I'm showing you this. If, if we take out the anthropogenic drivers, most particularly the CO2 emissions, and rerun the best of these our models, we are unable, the climate modelers are unable to, to produce results, particularly as we get late into, the sec late into the century. So really, this shows that our models need greenhouse gas inputs to the atmosphere to represent the way climate has unfolded over this past century. And this fits with our observations in the ice cores, recall those, and puts the modeling work I believe, on a really strong footing. So here again, in black, is the second half of Muller's video, um, the 20th century, basically. And departing from that are predictions made by these models. Um, and the various predictions are driven by various greenhouse gas emission scenarios, mostly CO2. That is, so, so each of the lines represents the aggregate effects of an ensemble of human choices. Um, if we acknowledge the large uncertainties that propagate uh, in time and that really escalate through this, recall this tiny wafer of geologic time, perched as it is 
on our little peak of the Pleistocene. We acknowledge all of that. These simulations, these predictions, are accepted by a strong majority of the climate and greater earth science communities, myself included. So I think that these represent, of course, work is ongoing, but simulations of this type basically give us our best idea of how climate will unfold over the next several human generations. The uncertainties are large. We're, you recall, we're in uncharted territory in the Holocene part of the Pleistocene, and the ride is bumpy. We know that that's the case. Uh, the effects at any place on Earth are even more uncertain. Recall the patchy, dynamic nature of the, of the video that we looked at. And these predicted changes, we want to note, are very large compared to what we have experienced over the last several thousand years. Anyway, from my point of view, um, this represents what we have to work with as we contemplate our climate future. So finally, uh, I wrap up as regards ethical collective action, where I'm strictly a layperson. I'm struck by the biophysical complexity of this exercise and the, and the large time dimension over which the problem unfolds, and we contemplate it. As regards the role of science, and earth science in particular, in ethical collective action, I live in a conservative legislative district in eastern Washington. And I wonder all the time how we and I can contribute most usefully to this. Um, so my presentation here reflects my current thinking on our reporting responsibilities as earth scientists. Thanks. Um, I was just thanking people. You didn't need to hear that, right? Um, saying how much I like it here, so who cares, really. Um, so my job uh, now, these days, is to basically take uh, the work of scientists like Kent uh, and um, his colleagues and the kind of the ethical intuitions that, um, that Bill introduced and combine them to work on policy solutions. And the particular area in which I work on policy solutions is in the, in the area of international climate negotiations. And um, um, some people are squinting already. You're not going to need to know all the information on here. Um, the, uh, um, what I want to talk about is just sort of one, really kind of one slice of what I think is the quandary over the central ethical dilemma of finding a solution um, to the problem that, as we've outlined it so far, um, and going to hint at kind of one of one way in which we could sort of think about around our way around finding a, um, a solution to that problem. Um, this slide just sort of represents, we've been having um, international climate summits, UN climate summits. Some of you came to a talk I gave earlier in the day where I sort of went into great detail, uh, probably more detail than some of you wanted to hear about the, the history of the international climate negotiations going back now 20 years. In fact, this summer is going to be the 20th anniversary of the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit in 1992, which was where, which was the summit that launched the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the body that I uh, work in and alongside uh, many, many uh, representatives from national governments to try to come up with a workable international framework for limiting greenhouse gas emissions. And in the 20 years um, that, uh, that that process has been going on, um, we still haven't yet created the, the right, we haven't come to find the sweet spot of the right combination of carrots and sticks to produce an international agreement among the 194 parties that are represented there that could limit greenhouse gas emissions. What we actually have today, uh, and there's a, there's a summit, there's one of these UN climate summits every year, it lasts for two weeks, usually in uh, early December. The last one was in Durban, South Africa, 
And out of the last of these, of these uh, 20 UN you know, framework convention meetings, we now sort of are in this kind of very kind of uncertain period where we actually have three kind of competing um, frameworks moving along. The Kyoto Protocol, um, uh, something called the Cancun Agreements, and what's newly, newly started Durban Platform. Um, and essentially all three of them are working in different ways towards slowly the creation of an international agreement on greenhouse gas emissions. The Kyoto Protocol is the one that probably most of you have heard of before. It was the first international climate treaty that was created um, uh, um, from our perspective during the Clinton administration. The U.S. played a very active role in helping to create the Kyoto Protocol, but then the United States did not sign on to the Kyoto Protocol. It basically divides the world into two buckets. Um, developed countries and developing countries. And under the terms of the Kyoto Protocol, looking at the sort of the central issue that Bill alluded to, what's the best way to divide up the pie? What's the fairest way to divide up the pie in terms of who reduces their emissions um, at what uh, degree and at what time, time frame? Um, it basically sort of says, well, in, since uh, most of the carbon emissions, and as we saw from uh, Kent's uh, uh, presentation, um, the, you know, uh, we've seen for, we have millions of years of evidence of the relationship between um, carbon degrees of um, amounts of concentrations of carbon in the atmosphere and temperature. Um, carbon lasts for a long time. About um, half of all carbon emissions um, last around 100 years. Some 20% will last thou persist thousands of years. And they exert this forcing um, on temperature uh, increase. And so given the sort of the, the historical emissions, the fact that the one degree that we've seen so far, about approximately one degree in temperature increase we've seen so far, was really caused by the carbon that wealthy countries like ours put into the atmosphere. Kind of the crude division is that um, wealthy developed countries should take the first cut and the deepest cut to reduce emissions, and developing countries will follow afterwards. And that's sort of the basic principle of fairness. The Kyoto Protocol does that. It divides the world between developed and developing countries. It says that developed countries um, should um, reduce their emissions around 5% by this year, by, 20, by 2012, in its so-called first commitment period. Um, uh, and that developing countries need not immediately move towards reducing their emissions. Um, at this point, now we've gone into what's called the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, as of this meeting in Durban. And only one group of countries has been willing to sign on to a second period, and that is the European Union. So the, Euro the countries of the European Union have said they will agree to continue to reduce their emissions according to this treaty. But at this point, the countries of the European Union, in part because they've actually done so well in reducing their emissions under the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol up until this year, only account for about 12% of global carbon emissions. So a treaty that binds only those parties isn't a treaty that's really going to get very far in solving the problem. In fact, if you zeroed out all the emissions from the European Union, you still would see temperature increase go well above two, three, four degrees, potentially in the future, if everyone else continued to emit at the level they are now. We also have this other core set of agreements called the Cancun Agreements we've been working on since 2009. And they are sort of what we would call bottom-up agreements. So rather than a top-down protocol that requires cuts by countries, the Cancun Agreements say, all right, countries, what are you willing to do? Countries of the world, what are you willing to do unilaterally without a binding treaty to reduce your emissions by 2020. Um, and enough countries have signed on to that uh, set of agreements, around 110, representing over 80% of global emissions. So that's good news. But unfortunately, they have not yet um, determined, uh, have not yet committed to a reduction in emissions sufficient to hold temperature increases to where we'd want to see them. And incidentally, in the international community, what we functionally defined as a safe point is holding temperature increase to two degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels. And as Kent said, we're already at one. So how it's going to be very difficult. It may require lots of reductions to keep temperature increases from going, um, uh, from going above two degrees. So if you analyze all the things going on in the Cancun agreements, you don't yet have the reductions necessary to get where you need to go. And so in Durban, um, because of a lot of interesting uh, issues that happened with the, uh, with the geopolitics involved in these negotiations, the parties agreed to commit to a new treaty. And the new treaty, which has to be finished by 2015, will, bring, will hopefully bring all the parties into an agreement which will be binding for all of them equally, won't require all of them to make the same reductions, but nonetheless will bind all of them equally and will um, hopefully get us to the reductions we need moving forward. Now, there's lots of ins and outs in this, and we can talk about it in discussion later. The interesting thing about this 
is that while there are lots of ways in which moral issues show up in these international climate negotiations, there is no track for discussing questions of responsibility or equity or what should be the allocation of, reduc of reductions of emissions by the parties that are represented in these negotiations. Um, and part of the reason there is that it is so incredibly difficult to get the parties to agree on what counts as a fair share of reductions. Now, this is complicated in part because uh, this, this sort of global parliament, as it were, that's trying, been working on a climate treaty for 20 years now, there are 194 parties uh, in, this, uh, in these negotiations, each one of them has a veto on the outcome. So as I was saying earlier today, uh, my friends in Washington who work on you know, tr the, the very difficult uh, task of getting a piece of legislation through the U.S. Senate think it's so hard to get 60 votes out of 100. In this forum, you need 194 votes out of 194 votes to get anywhere. And that makes things very, very difficult to, discern, to determine you know, difficult questions like um, what's a fair share of reduction. So let me just give you an example of this. And then I'll point to a solution. So here's what I'm going to call an equity dilemma involved in this. So a lot of key countries in the Framework Convention um, have taken a sort, of the, the, sort of the common term that's used to describe why rich countries should cut their emissions more and poor countries shouldn't have to reduce their emissions as much. Nonetheless, while everyone has to move to reduce their emissions some, is this phrase common but differentiated responsibilities, which comes from the 1992 Framework Convention that set up this process. And many parties, some of the most important parties in the developing world, uh, and I'll give you an example of this in a second, think that what this means is kind of, kind of what Bill alluded to. Um, something like um, per capita equity. You take the amount of emissions allowable um, up to a certain point, say to the point where we would go over two degrees Celsius, and you divide it by seven billion people, and then you allocate. You sort of say, okay, well, each country, you can sort of continue to emit a certain amount. Minus, though, how much you've already emitted in the past, right? So given how long carbon persists in the atmosphere, and then it continues to cause this problem. So if you've emitted a lot in the past, then you shouldn't really be, you have to be deducted from your tally, and so you can't be allowed to emit as much going forward. And this is called the argument for historical per capita equity. Um, and this leads to some kind of formula. I'll give you a, a schematic of one of these. Uh, these people try to come up, okay, what's the right, how, what's the formula? Different forms of what are called carbon budgeting. But the interesting thing that's most uh, about this is it often winds up describing um, emissions not as a kind of a bad thing, something to be avoided, but as a positive right, right? So if you're going to take the amount of emissions that we are, are, we are left um, to push into the global commons of the atmosphere um, and say each party has the, has, uh, uh, is, is going to get a, a, an allocation of that, then emissions become a right. A right to what? A right to continue developing using fossil fuels. So here's an example. Um, India um, has been at the forefront of pushing a new equity track in these negotiations, which they've so far failed to do. Even though, even though these three treaties are moving forward, there's not an equity track yet. India puts it this way. Uh, and this is in a submission they made for what the agenda should have been for the Durban meeting. India believes that the reference to equitable access to sustainable development in the Cancun agreements, which is a phrase that you find in the Cancun agreements, takes within its fold an approach premised on an understanding of the atmosphere as a global common to which all nations must have equitable access. Equitable access for its part must derive from the notion that all human beings have an equal entitlement to the global atmospheric space, is very strong language, and that in determining just shares of the remaining atmospheric space, past usage or overusage of the global atmospheric space, those are historical emissions, must be taken into, an, into account. And this is the justification, and it's compelling. For developing countries like India with serious energy poverty and developmental challenges, all true, a climate regime built on principles that do not ensure equity will impose severe limitations on its ability to lift its people out of poverty. It is imperative, therefore, that the equitable basis on which the climate regime is to be structured first be discussed and fleshed out, and next be used as the optic through which the regime is interpreted and developed. Right? So that's their proposal, is that we need to think of, of carbon not as pollution, as is common, the common phrase which we use in Washington now, Washington, D.C., to talk about carbon, but as a positive right. Um, and you... One argument, and I won't go through this in, in great detail, is then you sort of take, you know, this amount of emissions, you divide, right, of allowable towards some tipping point, you divide it, you know, you allocate it to certain ones, and you get these results where India has um, the right, under this scheme, to continue to emit quite a lot more into the future, 
Uh, the United States has totally overdrawn, overdrawn on its emissions so far, and so we owe the rest of the world not just the, we are responsible not just to cut our emissions, but to pay for any emissions we continue to emit. And that's how it works out. Now, in these negotiations, as you can imagine, when the Indians made this proposal, the U.S. said, no, we won't do it. Um, and I've lost my uh, uh, something in here. But anyway, so officially the U.S. said, well, look, we're not going to, and, and, and where India made the, the, um, this proposal to introduce this track on equity was in the track that's going to create this new comprehensive climate agreement that people are working on now. And the U.S. said unequivocally no, and they said the reason was is because the problem with an agreement like the Kyoto Protocol is that it has this firewall that developed countries have to reduce their emissions, developing countries do not. And we can't really get to where we need to go. And what should appear here, which has disappeared, uh, uh, um, because the incompatibility of Macs and you know, PCs or whatever, um, is a slide that would have uh, solved the entire problem. No, a, sl a slide that would have actually said, shown you that um, uh, some, some modeling that was done by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which ran two different models, supposing that the U.S. and the other rich countries of the world reduced their emissions 80% by 2050, and developing countries waited until 2050 to start reducing their emissions, we have about a 12% a, a chance of holding temperature increase at 2 degrees Celsius. If you, if developing countries were to increase their ambitions so that they started reducing their emissions aggressively by 2025 and then did half as much as developed countries did, then we have something like a 70% chance of reducing, of holding temperature increase at two degrees Celsius. And so the U.S. said, look, we can't, we've got to make sure, we're worried that equity becomes a stalking horse for not requiring rapidly developing countries like India and China from reducing their emissions, so we say no to it. Now, the unofficially, I think that actually what's going on here is an objection about kind of uh, a fundamental objection that will be uh, um, um, uh, that uh, many philosophers might um, recognize, which is the whole question of responsibility. You know, like I said, the emissions that are causing, that are, have forced the one degree temperature increase we've seen so far are emissions that were made long ago bef well, and started well before, right? We knew of this relationship between emissions and um, rise in temperatures and the potential hazardous impacts of that. And so this is sort of like, you know, you're getting a statement in the mail saying, oh, it turns out, Bill, you've got a bank account you didn't know about in the bank of carbon, right? And you now owe $100 million, right? Um, and Bill would, you know, freak out about that and his kids would be unhappy and it would be bad. There would be no pie for the children. It would be quite terrible. So the, so this is sort of like, it's, it's this kind of, this lack of connection between the notion of responsibility for the problem, knowledge of responsibility, and the consequences that is one of the reasons why the U.S. doesn't like this proposal. More importantly, I think that what's going on here is a kind of um, um, uh, uh, the fact that this kind of notion of treating carbon as a positive right doesn't jive with how the United States is reducing the emissions that it is reducing. You may recall we tried to get a national bill passed in 2009 to 2010, a national cap and trade, trade bill so the United States reduced its emissions. It got through the House of Representatives. It failed to make it through the Senate, so the bill didn't go through. And since then, using the authority of the Environmental Protection Agency, the um, president has been in, 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 um, creating policies uh, um, to reduce emissions, both in the transportation sector and now in the, in sta from stationary sources of emissions in the, in the power sector. Um, a whole array of, of proposals that are now hopefully getting the United States' emissions down moving forward throughout the rest of this decade. The only reason that the president has the power to do this is because the EPA went through a process called an endangerment finding process where they defined carbon as pollution. So carbon dioxide, for the purposes of U.S. regulatory law now, is pollution. And in that respect, and it, it is only the force of CO2 being a pollutant that the United States can, in fact, the president has the authority to reduce emissions. In that respect, if the United States signed on to an agreement that India has proposed, right, where we treat carbon as a positive right, it wouldn't work at all with respect to the, the basis of the regulatory authority that we have now. So there would be a, a big disconnect there. Now, um, uh, uh, what do we do with this? This is a muddle that sort of seems like, how do you possibly work your way out of this? And my answer is, in fact, what we ought to do um, for, in terms of the equity arguments right now, I think um, India has proposed that we, turn, we create, we do, in fact, create a track to work out puzzles over equity, and I completely uh, support that. There should be a track in the negotiations where they try to figure out a solution to that for the new treaty. 
But in the meantime, what I think what we should focus on is those parts of the of our of our um, of greenhouse gas pollution that don't share these complicating factors of historical emissions, and these are called short-lived now short-lived climate forcers. So other greenhouse gases like methane and HFCs and black carbon, which we commonly call call soot, are much shorter lived in the atmosphere. Methane lasts 14 years. Um, most HFCs last even less than that, but they often have tens of times, if not hundreds or thousands of times more potential to increase the temperature than CO2 does. If we were to focus on that cluster of greenhouse gases first and try to reduce those, then in fact we would get a lot of positive benefits. For one, as was um, proven, as demonstrated in a wonderful paper that Drew Shindell of NASA published in Science um, this past January, that if you took 13 fairly fairly easy measures to reduce just methane and black carbon around the world, you could effectively lower the temperature of the planet now by half a degree. And that's very important. Now, you can't lock in that savings unless you also reduce CO2 in the future. But nonetheless, you could actually get us some breathing space on the, you know, the scary sort of increase in, 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 in temperature that we sort of see with the, the models that can't ran, uh, ran, uh, ran for us. The other thing is that these we call carbon pollution in, in, in regulatory law now in the United States, but it's not really pollution in the same sense that, so lead is pollution. Um, so we're all breathing, you know, you know, we're sort of exposed to CO2 now. It's not harming us in the same way that overexposure to lead or mercury would. But these HFCs and black carbon are actually conventional pollutants. They do actually cause illnesses among people. If we focused on those now, then in fact, according to the Schindel paper and sort of others, you could avoid up to 4 million deaths by 2030, if you did those 13 policies, you could also increase crop yields by 30 to 135 million tons annually by 2030. And in that respect, you could actually get a benefit if you focused on those um, which, would, um, which would pay for itself, right, more effectively than we can actually immediately see the way in which CO2 reductions pay for themselves. Um, now, the great thing about these short-lived climate forcers being short-lived is that you don't have to worry about the same kind of pluses and minuses of dividing the world up. You can actually take a more equitable distribution. You take the total amount of methane being, um, being emitted now, and you say, look, we've all got a common responsibility for reducing it, which is not offset by the amount we've emitted in the past, which I think makes things much simpler. So I think one way in which we can look at the equity puzzles is, in fact, and this is to borrow uh, the great phrase uh, that um, Kent gave us, and I wrote it down, um, is that the, bio, the, the biophysical reality is a constraint on ethical behavior. I think that's right. And I think in this case, the biophysical reality can also be an opportunity for ethical behavior. If we focused on those pollutants first, it could ma actually make it easier for us to come up with a just distribution of the reductions. Thank you. Kind of unusual. <clears throat> you don't have a, uh, either a barometer or something where we're going. Can we move that microphone here? Is that all right? Can you sit down there? Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me in the back? No, I guess it's not on. Is it on? Hello? Can you hear me in the back? OK. Well, thank you for coming and uh, making it to a f yet a fourth talk. I hope I'm interesting. Um, let me begin uh, organizing my comments by bracketing two key terms in the title of today's public discussion the word ethics and the word uncertainty. And I would like to bracket those words in order to provide a context for, I think, three very important questions that are key to the issue of ethics in this context. The first is, what is the proper role of scientists in the public policy debates like those surrounding climate change? How do we translate science into ethical decision making? Secondly, what logical foundations or constraints does ethical philosophy provide in addressing that question? And then finally, how might we overcome philosophical limitations of science policy and ethics? 
as a way of approaching the first question, the proper role of scientists, let me read a quote from a 1990 issue of Science Magazine, which many of you know is the largest circulation scientific publication in the world. So the, I quote as follows. Last fall, an edit editorial in the Detroit News slammed a meteorologist. That's a misstatement. He was a climatologist. Stephen Schneider, uh, this is referring to my friend, uh, the brilliant climatologist who died in 2010, for contributing to, quote, the debasement of American environmental science into cheap political theater. Schneider's offense, it seemed, was a step outside his role as a scientist and publicly advocate a response to the global climate change that many researchers predict will take place in the next century. Now, there's several things to note at this point. This was in 1990 when, and you can see now, this is 22 years later, and we're still trying to make progress on having the right people believe that this is taking place. And there's another context item. It was only in 1988 that Jim Hansen of NASA appeared before Congress and made the statement that uh, there's a 90% chance we're warming the planet. So we have this uh, window here. This 20-plus-year-old question remains very much with us today, although we now have a much more nuanced and refined understanding of it and of its magnitude. What are some of the elements of that magnitude? First, while our context here today is global climate change, the question has a far, far broader reach, and I'll give some examples. It applies to a wide range of public policy issues that have these common defining features. One, all require scientific input. With increased complexity, it requires increased input. The role for science here is indispensable. This in many ways represents a new twist in uh, modern policy. Second, all fall into a category we can call grand risks. That is risk with the potential impacts for the entire planet, for large numbers of people, or for the things that value. And so what do we mean by risk? Often it's used without definition. We mean risk, a condition, scenario, or event where something of human value, including humans themselves, is at stake and where the outcome is uncertain. And the third characteristic that may, cuts across these very broad or grand risks, all are either in total or in core parts have high degrees of uncertainty. And what do we mean by uncertainty here? We mean an indeterminacy between cause and effect. And that could be for many reasons. As Ken pointed out, it could be for complexity. Don't know feedback, uh, feedback uh, relationships. We don't know initial starting causes. Uh, and there are a whole variety of reasons for that. There's spurious relationships. There's time lags in relationships. In any sense, we, we live with uncertainty. So what are some examples of these? Well, obvious global climate change today's topic. What's some other ones? Tipping points from climate change. For example, the large, uh, collapse of large ice sheets in Greenland or Antarctica would be, have devastating effects on the planet. Changes in the ocean circulation system. Uh, where's where's uh, Richard? Uh, it would, but done in a certain level, uh, England would be uninhabitable. Um, nuclear arsenals, there's still a capacity to destroy the entire planet. Emergent technology, such as nanotechnology, where the control of technology is at the atomic and molecular level. How well can we control this? And then, of course, is the economic sustainability of the planet itself. We're conducting an experiment with, a, uh, with planet Earth without any control or uh, placebo case. So the challenge is clear. With public policy more and more embedded within science, what is the ethical role for scientists? So to address this question, we can resort to a traditional strategy. Namely, let's see what some ethical philosophers have said about the issue. <clears throat> so a particularly influential figure in this context was the Cambridge philosopher G.E. Moore. Uh, one website calls him the single most influential British philosopher of the 20th century. That may be an exaggeration, but clearly he had some clear influence. In 1903, he wrote a very influential book, indeed still influential, titled Principia Ethica. The punchline of the book was this. It is logically impossible to derive ethical principles from nature. Nature, it just is. That means we can make categorical or is statements about nature, but we can't make ought statements about nature. Ethics, as its policy to some extent, is about, is about ought, permitting us to make normative statements to tell us, uh, give us direction on what is appropriate thing to do. 
So the idea of the good or the right was not to be found in the natural world, or in general, any human ideal was not to be found in nature. According to Moore, if one attempts to make normative statements on the basis of nature, it results into what's called a logical fallacy, and he named it the naturalistic fallacy. That is the fallacy of looking at nature, drawing some idealistic conclusion, and then using it as a guideline for developing normative standards for how we conduct our business. So what consequence did Moore's uh, naturalistic fallacy have for doing science? Where did this leave, uh, leave ethically leave scientists? To answer that, we need to fast forward to Vienna, Austria, the 1920s, where a group of scientists, philosophers, mathematicians, logicians, sought to develop a system of scientific logic that separated science from mathematics, pure logic, philosophy, and other systems of thought. The resultant system was called logical positivism, and with minor modification, it remains the underlying logic of the traditional social sciences today. A key rule for separating science from other systems of thought was derived from none other than G.E. Moore. Namely, don't mix categorical with normative claims. This, of course, repeats the dilemma that scientists have today. The role of science, proper role of science, is to make Observations about the world, not statements about how the world should be. <clears throat> so with that background, we're now well positioned to understand the admonition Steve Schneider attracted in 1990, and in fact, indeed, throughout his entire life. And that leads us to the final question. How might we overcome the philosophical limitations of naturalistic fallacy channeled through logical positivism imposed upon we scientists? There's no doubt of, there are no doubt a variety of routes out of this paradox. I've yet thought of some, hopefully you will think of some others. Let me suggest one by returning to the original source of the problem, namely G.E. Moore himself uh, and his, uh, his other position in philosophy. As a background issue, there are two very broad approaches to ethics. One is called a deontological approach, meaning this is where we devise a desirable state of affairs and then we develop a system of, of dealing with that state of affairs. Here, the important thing is intent. The second approach is a consequentialist approach. The logic here emphasizes outcome. We're not particularly care about either the coherence or the particular uh, normative elements of the statements, but in fact, do they work in practice? It turns out that Jim uh, Moore himself was an exemplary realist and consequentialist. To him, the important thing is not intention, but outcome. So I think we can draw this implication. If Moore had written in 2003 instead of 1903, he would have had a century of enormous change, or consequence if you prefer, to re-examine his position. Two changes are particularly relevant here. One is developments in biology, and the second is the consequences of human actions on the global environment, including climate. So what were some of the key developments in biology that might have had more reassess his position? Well, despite the fact that the origin of the species by Darwin's published in 1859, it was not fully accepted until the 1930s and 40s well, with what's called the modern evolutionary synthesis. Indeed, at the time Moore wrote Principia Ethica in 1903, Mendelism was the dominant theory in biology, not Darwinian theory. Once the synthesis took place in this century, our worldview of nature changed. It was also the worldview of Moore. It had changed from a static one to a dynamic one. We lived not in a static world of nature, but a dynamic nature that reacted to us and reacted to other species. So that was one major change that Moore might have taken into account in reassessing his position. The second were changes to the global environment. In fact, these changes, which I'm going to list some of them, have been so great that the last part of the Pleistocene, the Holocene, that Kent mentioned has now been renamed the Anthropocene because of the fact that changes are not, the major changes taking place to the Earth is not due to natural processes, but to uh, human actions. So another hindsight provided in 2003 and ever since about the relationship between humans and dynamic nature was the unprecedented assault we're making on the equal functioning of nature. What are these? Growing emissions, uh, driving climate change. Uh, ground level air pollutant that uh, was mentioned here, causing uh, chronic health and uh, fatal health effects. Rapid exhaustion of natural capital and services. 
the loss of numerous species of plants and animals, vast changes in land cover, the dis uh, distribution of toxic and hormone-disrupting chemicals everywhere. So we can imagine the many possibilities these hindsights might have provided more to reassess this position. And hopefully you'll be thinking of some yourself, and perhaps this is a good time for your best imagination in this particular area. I can't resist uh, mentioning just one that might be suggested by a WAG. As a consequentialist, more, more I might have recognized that a strict adherence to the principle of keeping it separate from law could lead to this real consequence. If we don't say that our assault on the global ecology, such as warming the planet, ought not to be continued, then the reality be no future generations to enjoy the luxury of considering such lofty ethical issues of whether this, it is logical or not to commit the naturalistic fallacy. Uh, we've had a lot to think about. We've got uh, time for a few questions. I'll uh, ask you to raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you so we can get it on tape. Is it okay if it's to anyone? Yeah. Okay, my question is for Mr. Light. I'm not sure he's... Mr. Light. Oh. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, um, I'm not sure if this was something that I missed, but um, the 13 easy changes that you were talking about to lower the um, emissions. Like to lower methane and black carbon. Yeah. yeah, would that be something that was necessary internationally or is that within the United States alone? Internationally. So, so what Shindell and it's about, I think, 27 or so colleagues, international coll uh, colleagues from around the world sort of monitored, looked at was you know, 14 ways which you can reduce emissions um, from these areas. Um, now, uh, the, some of them um, are, are kind of well underway. So one of the big, big sources of black carbon in developing countries is from cook stoves. So inefficient cook stoves that burn, um, you know, dung or, you know, or, or wood or something like that. Can you, if you had a global integra integrated program to switch out inefficient cook stoves with um, more efficient, even non-carbon non polluting or low carbon polluting, um, uh, cooking vessels, um, to more ambitious things about, you know, reducing soot from diesel emissions um, and methane from other sectors, including the agricultural sector. Now, um, all of these are ambitious, but the good thing about sort of taking on the short-lived climate forcers is they're not, in some ways, they're constrained to sectors of the economy. Um, big and important sectors of the economy, if you think about it, CO2 emissions, which we mostly get um, from um, from, from the electricity sector and the transportation sector and from, from buildings. Um, really, what, when we're talking about CO2 emissions, one of the reasons it's so difficult to get a global deal on that is because you're talking about a change which would affect the entire global economy. Um, whereas if we look at taking on the short-lived climate forcers, even globally, you're talking about smaller sectors of the economy where there might be off-the-shelf technology already now that you could replace, right, for the polluting, the polluting systems. Next, next question. Uh, no, I think this is for all of you, but um, all of us. Yes. So in uh, on March twenty second, two thousand twelve, in the New York Review of Books, William Nordhaus recently published a piece saying he said the only skepticism left is in the pocket of big oil or the like. And I mean, I was thinking when Bill was talking the ethics of expertise, but I don't have to be an expert to know that sort of it's only propped up phonies, right? If, if the only skepticism is coming from big oil, I might be, that might be enough of a warning shot. And I just wonder if that's, if that's the sense now. I mean, my, my only concern is that uh, sort of you're preaching to the choir a little bit and we kind mm -hmm. of, I'm not a skeptic myself. My, my question is, is there any climate skepticism left that is still respectable? I think Andrew Light was saying earlier, there's, there's disagreement about remote and local consequences, exactly which island will be under how much water, but there's not disagreement that the tide is coming. I would say that paying attention to where the money uh, comes from that's funding certain kinds of skepticism is part of the implication of the ethics of 
receiving expert testimony, right? Um, it, hopefully this is going to be a historical case study more than an ongoing debate, right? We can ask ourselves, how did it take so long to get to a place where we could just acknowledge this? Uh, uh, one small indicator of uh, the, uh, the, the position of skeptics is there's the current issue of the New York Review of Books that uh, has the skeptics criticizing what Nordhaus said in his response. And it seems to me that's one of our largest or most respected public intellectual sources. And if they give him them some uh, cachet to have their uh, platform, to me that's at least some indication that somewhere, someplace, people are still giving them some credibility. Uh, so I, I guess my quick answer would just be, um, um, and, I, and I say this, so my, my wife's the national environmental reporter for the Washington Post, so, so she, which makes dinner conversations kind of interesting, so um, something we're not allowed to talk about to each other, which is <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, the, but she's interviewed, you know, several of, of these people, Richard Lindzen in MIT, you know, folks like that. And I would sort of say, are there still some knowledgeable, authentic, honest skeptics out there? Sure there are. There are a very few number of them, but I think there actually are some people out there who are not, you know, bought and paid for by any interests. And I think that they remain, um, you know, um, I, I wouldn't want to, I don't want to, I hesitate to use the word like contrarian because it has a certain kind of implication. But I think that people who, you know, are sort of saying, no, 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 it's, it's sort of there's something wrong with this kind of view. Um, and I think there's certainly a lot of people who don't know a lot about, who are scientists who don't know a lot about atmospheric science, who are kind of skeptics of a sort and unfortunately present themselves as experts. And I think that's kind of the more, that's kind of the more worrisome crowd. It's sort of a few isolated people I'm not so worried about, it's always going to be the case with like any kind of major scientific theory, it would sort of be odd, I mean, given the nature of science, if there weren't, if there was complete unanimity, but I think we have, you know, you know the Nas National Academy of Sciences, I guess, did this, this survey, some 98%, right, of Kent and his colleagues, and people would actually think of as people who are really atmospheric scientists, um, and, and fairly broad uh, affiliated scientists, even if they're not, don't call themselves climatologists, some 98% say, yes, it's happening, and, you know, exactly as you, as you sort of, um, describe what's going on. Um, but I'm more worried about this. So for example, just a few days ago, I think it was on Monday, um, about 50 NASA scientists and employees signed a joint letter basically saying, complaining to the head of NASA um, because, so for example, I mentioned Drew Shindell's paper in Science, which t shows what you can do with these short-lived climate forcers. Drew Shindell's at NASA. Um, uh, um, Jim Hansen, one of the most vocal sort of um, um, scientific figures in climate change is also at NASA. The Goddard Space Center in New York does a lot of the climate modeling that you sort of saw in Kent's presentation. And, and so 50 you know, people from NASA um, said, right, well, we, we are all experts, NASA experts, and we really disagree with how NASA is getting behind the shoddy science where the jury is still out. Now, if you, quickly, if you look, though, carefully at those list of 50 figures, they're a bunch of former astronauts, they're a bunch of spaceflight engineers, they're people who actually shot rockets, you know, up to the moon or, you know, worked on Skylab, for example. Um, and, and what's most, I think, worrisome, though, is the folks who sort of say, look, I just know enough. The same thing is true of actually meteorologists um, or especially TV weathercasters. The biggest, <laughs> it's tr absolutely true. And my colleague, um, uh, Ed Maybach at George Mason University did, ama did an amazing survey uh, at the Center for Climate Change Communication. And so there's a, a, not more than half, but a critical mass, upwards of 30, 40%, almost half of all weathermen are, are climate skeptics. And most Americans say that they get their information on climate change first from weathermen or weather people, and secondly, right, from climate scientists. And so a significant proportion of meteoro broadcast meteorologists are climate skeptics. And you dig into, well, why is, and, so, and, and these are people, people do well, so, but there's a difference, obviously, between weather and climate, right? But many people don't understand this difference. And when you dig into, you know, why they sort of say things like this, they've got some interesting reasons, but nonetheless, and this goes back to Bill's point on expertise, we're kind of not sure who the relevant experts are out there. And that makes the sort of the skepticism thing kind of um, bigger than just the few number of people that were surveyed, you know, Ken's colleagues who might be holding. May I ask for a No, no. <laughs> no especially you. Okay. Uh, so I, uh, 
you know, I, uh, I concur with, with all of what I've heard, and uh, I, I do think that part of the problem is maybe this uh, tendency to insist on certainty, and if we don't have certainty, then we don't really know, and so, you know, maybe not. And, and I've, I've, we're, we're just not certain about any aspect of this. I, I've talked with climate modelers, and as I've said, I am not one, but I made a point of talking with them when I can, and none of them that I have talked to has said, no, it's not possible that the trajectory might not do this. Okay? I mean, the, that's, that's the unfortunate part of it. Now, now, in pointing that out, I am not backing away at all from my contention that we have to work with these predictions. I am not at all. The thing is, like anything else in science, they are not absolutely certain. And I, I think that's, that's part of the problem. Matt? As the co-instructor with Kent in one of the classes that Bill referred to dealing with ethics and the environment in this campus, I want to thank this panel for being here and, and the sponsors, and especially welcome Andrew Light, and we're delighted to have you. Next time we'd like to have you in our class as well. Uh, but the, the point I'd like to make, I'd like to take a little bit of issue with my friend Bill about the role of experts. It seems to me that one of the problems we've gotten into is that the general public, maybe the uh, independent voter, if you will, tends to view uh, experts as people who are imposing their world views, not just talking about the cause and effect relationships that they're expert in. And when we begin to confuse the expert as someone who says, this is what I do know, versus this is what I think ought to happen, and Gene referred to this in his talk, it seems to me that the credibility of all experts then goes downhill and we ended up, end up in a political mess. Uh, so that seems to me to be one of, the, one of the dilemmas that we've gotten ourselves into here. If you're asking me whether I think all scientists should have to take philosophy of science courses and ethics courses as a part of their training, <laughs> let me respond with a yes. <laughs> and part of the problem, I think, is that uh, scientists are sometimes not sufficiently sensitive to all the kinds of philosophical and ethical dynamics that go into their understanding of the problems they study and that sort of thing. Sure. And I think scientists who are experts in science should recognize that their expertise is in the domain of science, not in making normative claims. That's the domain of ethics experts. But I'm happy to report, and this, this is sort of a follow-up to Gene's presentation, there's a whole area of philosophy that's developed since uh, G more in the logical positivists that constitutes uh, a vigorous engagement between philosophers and scientists and healthcare practitioners and environmental scientists and the like, and that's bioethics. So. We have one, Can you say one, one, one quick thing on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. for the, just, so just, it's Matt? Yeah. Matt. Um, so you said this very quickly, and I think you would probably agree with me on the point I want to make, but I want to make it sort of for everyone uh, before I fly away tomorrow, which is that the political controversy over climate science is, is unique to the United States. The fact that the disagreements, the reasonable disagreements over uncertainty has sort of blossomed into this political divide is something that exists nowhere else on the planet. Um, and this is interesting. And the reason is because it was a strategy. It was a strategy to make you think, right, that this is a conspiracy, that climate science is a conspiracy to get you to give up your freedom. Now, my one example of the proof of this, and this is a point that my um, friend Jay Inslee, who's running for some office around here now, I understand, <laughs> um, often made, um, when he was, was cross-examining people during the, the climate bill, the House climate bill, which Jay was, was, was instrumental in getting, in getting uh, out, of the, out of the House of Representatives. Um, the biggest, the big organization in the United States, the climate service organization, is called the Heartland Institute. And the Heartland Institute had their big national convention um, in my neighborhood last, last summer in Washington, in, uh, in Woodley Park. And so, you know, it was my neighborhood, so I went. Right, you know, to, to their to their skeptical meeting, because I wanted to hear crazy science. I wanted to hear like you sort of the, you know, I wanted to. All right, this will get my juices going. Right, if I sort of hear like the crazy science, and I didn't hear any. In every panel I went to, time after time again, you know, the major organization for climate skeptics were sort of saying, you know, all they wanted to talk about was how climate regulation was a form of socialism that was being imposed on the United States to take away people's freedom, and that was the message they were pushing again and again and again. It had nothing to do with what the experts were, and we're not saying what they were tripping up into, but this is a concentrated effort to make us believe that this debate is about something other than what it's about. Gene, do you have a quick I just want to make a comment uh, in response to Kent uh, in terms of uh, uncertainty. Um, 
I've had this debate with Steve Schneider and others. Uh, the source of the problem is scientists themselves, especially the curricula. Um, I think most correctly inculcate people to believe science is certitude. And they go through that curriculum, and perhaps they go through graduate school and are disabused of it. When in fact, all science is laden with uncertainty. And perhaps if we re revamp curricula, take that into account rather than pushing certitude, this might be a little less of a problem. Okay. We have one last question. Okay. Uh, this is largely for uh, um, Kent Keller. Um, I seem to recall the book, uh, The Two Mile Time Machine, uh, a couple, 15, 20 years ago, written by, who, yes, who was, I think, 20 years involved in ice cores. Uh, and uh, what I seem to recall is that there were fluctuations in average temperature, more like 30 degrees compared to the six to eight degrees. And I'm wondering if that's true, that this reflects on part of the other conversation, that when we talk about two or three degrees, the average person who's experienced far, you know, larger uh, seasonal changes tends to take it not seriously. If you talk about 30 degrees change in average temperature, I think that people will recognize it's really catastrophic potential. Is that? Well, um, I wish I were, were more expert, but, but I'm pretty sure that the, uh, the well, the, the, there are, uh, documentations of large temperature swings like this in certain places, but but they appear to be local to regional in the ice core records. The, the swings I was talking about are are planetary in in distribution. Yeah, there there are much larger swings. Some of them dramatically sudden um, in in certain spots. All right, I, I know several more of you had questions you wanted to ask, but unfortunately our time is up, which tells me this is probably gonna be a topic we'll do in a future uh, symposium. Um, for those of you who want to get more information about the Foley Institute and get our regular mailers, or those of you who may be here for a class, there's some sign-up sheets uh, out this door. Uh, that you can go sign your name and email address to. And now on behalf of the Foley Institute, on behalf of the School of, of uh, uh, Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs, I want you to join me now in uh, thanking our panel for a very interesting discussion.